like to introduce our next speaker, Daniel Schwartz. He teaches here at UNM. He's been teaching in universities in California and Arizona and New Mexico for the past 35 years. His interests and in publications reflect his broad academic background in cultural anthropology, sociology, and public health. He presently teaches environmental sociology in the sociology department here at the university. His education began at a community college and continued in California in the 60s, uh, where he received degrees at California State U and Los Angeles, University of California, Berkeley. A significant part of his education was gained from experience in various social movements for peace, justice, and environmental protection, starting with the movement to end the war in Vietnam in 1964 and continuing on with us here today. Mr. Schwartz. Thank you, Serena. I appreciate the introduction. It's a beautiful day. We need to save the chili and save the children, too. Um, my first teaching, let me see, it was about 47 years ago. <laughs> hard to believe uh, I was an undergraduate in California uh, regarding the war in Vietnam. So here I am again. I'm very happy to be here uh, and relish this opportunity because it's a privilege for me to be here at this time and at this university because things are happening all over the country and all this enables universities to become more vibrant more alive. So I think it's, it's quite wonderful. I'm going to talk about why the Occupy movement really needs to evolve. It needs to transform and needs to succeed. This is a baby that's growing quickly. It's really been only eight weeks since Occupy Wall Street took root. And it needs nurturing. There are those, of course, who would like to have it never exist. But something has happened in our culture, in our society, that's very, very positive. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to address where did it come from and why now. It, a lot of this is speculation, because it's in process. But during the past 30 years, the United States has become increasingly brittle with worsening gross inequality, loss of commons, declining public investment and public health, increased militarism, a disintegrating infrastructure and degraded environment. Dr. King's prophetic message has generally been ignored as political discourse and public policy moves to the right. The U.S. has lost its way as it in many ways resembles a militarized third world nation. Meanwhile, failures are defended as if they were successes. The grassroots Occupy movement has brightly and vigorously taken root and flowered in part as a reaction to the actions of the Bush administration and the continuation or worsening of public policy discourse and actions under the Obama administration. Candidate Obama raised the expectations, especially among the younger generations. generation. These high expectations were not forthcoming or borne out in his priorities and actions as president. Of course, he broke people's hearts. No wonder folks are kind of heartsick feel betrayed and do not trust national electoral politics. This is a powerful lesson as to how power in the U.S. generally operates. The ruling elite stack the deck and like to win no matter who becomes president. <coughs> Herbert Marcuse, who was influential for those of us in the 1960s, who wrote a magnificent book called One Dimensional Man, he stated in 1964, Free election of masters does not abolish the masters or the slaves. Yet arrogance and hubris 
and the abuse of power seldom prepare the 1% for grassroots movements embraced by a younger generation like that which happened during the 1960s. And this movement comes with great passion, spontaneity, creativity, and joyousness like Occupy Wall Street and the entire Occupy movement throughout the United States and elsewhere. Two popular uprisings this past year showed inspirational possibilities for both democracy and occupation. One was the ongoing Arab Spring, and the other was the resistance in Madison, Wisconsin. The 99% came together in solidarity and were empowered to occupy the Wisconsin State House. To what degree they provided a spark to the current Occupy movement is not entirely clear uh, to me. People generally need to feel their oppression in a psychological, emotional, or physical manner in order to question authority and act to liberate themselves and change their social world. Uprisings are not mainly based on abstractions. The dangers to legitimate grievances are co-optation by the power structure to suit their own agenda and intense repression which can resemble a police state. And of course, we don't want that to happen. Clearly, First Amendment protections are critically important in creating a space and time for resistance and change. In my mind, the First Amendment is being compromised nationally and locally. It is not something that should be doled out, especially at the flagship University of New Mexico. The protections in the First Amendment must not be criminalized. Part of the reason for criminalization is that the Occupy movement questions the nature and distribution of power, legitimacy, decision-making, and wealth. That's called political economy. These are fundamental to the manner in which the ruling elites operate. Restrictions and repression at this point appear to be arbitrary and capricious. How far will they go? I don't know. In what direction? The 1% may choose to repress the Occupy movement, but that can lead to more resistance and increasing numbers. Historically, oftentimes, when there's repression, there's resistance. The Occupy encampments become sacred spaces, places where democracy, education, and First Amendment rights are practiced where the building of a new and growing community is taking place. The encampment at Yale Park was vital, alive, and generally wondrous. It always lifted my spirit. Shared knowledge and learning were put to use for positive social change, like a call for a moral economy, not like the one we have. Certainly students and their families feel the crushing debt of attending a university. And student debt is now more than one trillion dollars. These are astronomical figures. More than credit card debt. The banks are making a killing off of students. But it was not always this way. When I was an undergraduate, the system was much more fair and reasonable. Again, greed, unbridled power, and corruption. Oh, yeah. Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Albuquerque is a popular uprising, a resistance and multi-issue movement which practices nonviolence and building community. I hear diverse voices and I hear diverse stories. I also see them on Facebook and there are a number of sites now on Facebook. The 99% insist they will not be silenced, nor should they. I am heartened and profoundly touched seeing and hearing the power of voice and choice being made every day by the Occupy movement. It is special, necessary, and empowering. It has changed lives, and it will change lives. It steers clear of establishment party politics and is a non-electoral controlled movement for real hope and real change. 
It is new, in process, and evolving. It is a movement that wisely understands the need to slow down and reverse global warming and environmental catastrophe. It is a movement that understands the need to restore the public good, the commons, and the social contract. It is a movement against the immoral power of Wall Street and domination that exists in politics, public policy, education, health, welfare, and many other aspects of our lives. It is a movement for nonviolence and peace. It speaks to the spirit of life, not to the peace of the cemetery. It is a movement against growing militarism, continual warfare, killing machines, and imperial adventures. The choice should not be between guns or butter, because political leaders have been choosing guns. That is militarism and war. The American people, in every poll I've seen, are against this. They don't want continual spending in militarism and war. The choice, between, the choice should not be between private affluence and public squalor. That's an older expression by uh, Galbraith. Because political leaders have been choosing privatization, thereby diminishing the quality of life. They harm and go after the most vulnerable amongst us, like schoolyard bullies. Schoolyard bullies tool, taught me a lesson about justice that has stayed with me since I was 10 years old. The poor, the aged, the infirm, the homeless, not the top 1%. So where does the, our society get the money? Where do the politicians get the money to go to war? Not from the top 1%. The policies and programs of the 1% are leading towards environmental catastrophe and ecosystems collapse. We are already in the sixth greatest extinction period on this planet. So this is an ongoing moral, spiritual, and biodiversity bankruptcy. Our civilization really is not sustainable. We cannot have continuing unlimited growth on a finite planet. Meanwhile, the 1% want to put everything up for sale or commodify everything. Blood, the moon, the ocean, genes, seeds, knowledge, culture, and the future. Eco-feminist Vandana Shiva states, in nature's economy, the currency is not money. It is life. So we must act to protect our home the earth, and the spirit of life on our beautiful planet. This is a movement to protect and restore the earth. This is a movement to empower this nation to become just and fair. It is the American autumn, and we are not alone. Thank you.